Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 ACOM seminar series. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Charles Stanier. Dr. Stanier is a professor in the Department of Chemical and Biochemical Engineering and a member of IIHR Hydro Science and Engineering Institute in the University of, of Iowa. Dr. Stanier's research are in the fundamental and applied issues in air pollution, climate change, energy systems, and aerosol science. Um, he leads investigation focused on these system, system using field measurements and computational models. The goal of these studies are to advance solutions to air pollution, indoor air quality, and climate problems. Um, before I start, I would like to remind people following online that um, you can enter your questions in the space below the video at any time during the talk. At the end, I will read those questions. With that, I will leave the floor to Dr. Stanier. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for uh, having me uh, as a visitor. I'm really excited. Uh, and I just want to start with acknowledgments so that it, uh, I don't run out of time and skip this really important part. Uh, on my uh, CVMS, cyclic volatile methyl siloxanes work, my collaborators at Iowa are Rachel Merrick, Carrie Hornbuckle, and Betsy Stone, who could all be classified as analytical environmental chemists. Uh, and Ellie Brown here at CU Boulder. Uh, and my group is here in Boulder this week and next doing experiments uh, in collaboration with Ellie. Uh, our funding uh, for the current work is from NSF, and then I'm gonna be showing some older work that was funded by a seed grant at the University of Iowa. Uh, I'll be featuring work today from uh, two current graduate students, Saide Mohammadi, uh, who's here in the audience today, Chris Brunet, who's uh, Carrie Hornbuckle's student, and Nate Janicek, uh, who's an alum of my group and now at NOAA. We got a big list of other collaborators who've worked on uh, volatile chemical products and uh, siloxanes at Iowa, and I'll be giving kind of the historical view, so I'll be hitting on some of the papers and experiments uh, done by this group. I've circled the current group of undergraduates and graduate students uh, working on the NSF project. So what are cyclic volatile methyl siloxanes? So these are uh, used in personal care products and a volatile chemical, it's a volatile component of all silicone uh, materials. Uh, the two compounds that I'm gonna talk about the most are uh, we refer to them as D4. Um, I need to use this pointer. So these are cyclic compounds, uh, silicon oxygen ring terminated by methyl groups. Uh, there's a smaller version with four silicons and a larger version with five silicons. They're useful uh, in formulating personal care products because they are volatile. They evaporate off your hair they evaporate off your skin. They do not leave a greasy feel when they do so. Uh, and they play well with the other compounds that need to, the active ingredients that need to go into lotion, hair conditioner, antiperspirant. Most, hair, most antiperspirant is more than 50% by mass uh, CVMS compounds. They've been scrutinized for a long time due to persistence, bioaccumulation, and potential toxi toxicity. The result of those, um, that scrutiny has been uh, no restrictions in the US, no restrictions in Canada, but a prohibition in Europe on uh, D4 and D5 in wash-off cosmetics. It's present in blood, plasma, breath, breast milk, Pretty much, if you're sensitive enough, wherever you look, you will find these compounds uh, or their reaction products. Uh, it's present in high concentrations in landfill gas uh, because of all the personal care product residue that goes into the landfill and then off gases over time. 
is present in sewage digester gas and in sewage sludge. Um, it's a globally distributed compound. Uh, this is for D4, uh, and it's globally distributed because it's used pretty much everywhere and has a four to 10 day atmospheric lifetime. So this is a hemispheric model showing hot spots uh, in high population areas. So why is its fate important? Uh, so no, number one, this is a major compound class with millions of kilograms made per year, is present globally in many media. We should understand the fate after oxidation. Number two, because of this history of being regulated uh, due to persistence, industry has taken the standpoint of once it's oxidized, it's gone. <laughs> Right, because if we could find enough pathways that reduce its lifetime from 10 days to three days, it's no longer persistent, it's no longer regulated. Uh, but I think a more thorough, more thoughtful approach of thinking about the compound class as a whole is important. Um, it's increasingly measurable by PTRMS, uh, so you can uh, measure these compounds second by second in your field campaigns and use it as a tracer of people or a tracer of personal care product use. Uh, the climate and outdoor air quality implications depend on what the products are and what phase they're in. Is, are they, do they form particles? Do they not form particles? Uh, same with the indoor air uh, implications. Um, the chemical and physical properties may be applicable to other personal care products and other uh, silicones. And number seven, we've found some differences between the chamber studies and the oxidation flow reactor studies that may be instructive to uh, using oxidation flow reactors to inform uh, fate and transport of uh, many VOCs. At least I've learned some things. <laughs> so the key background information uh, that you need to sort of hopefully appreciate what I'm talking about. Uh, globally distributed compounds, um, I give the concentrations in uh, mass and mixing ratio depending on what you're used to looking at. These are not high concentrations, right? These are nanogram per cubic meter or, you know, if you a half a microgram per cubic meter for the parent compound, not, not the aerosol. Indoor concentrations are much higher uh, because we apply these products every day and then they off-gas in our cars and in our homes and our workplaces. Um, it mainly partitions to the atmosphere because it's hydrophobic. Uh, and so you can treat them as atmospheric compounds without, I mean, there are environmental compartment modelers who treat them in all environmental media in, in sludge, in water, in sediment, uh, and do all the, the partitioning. But most of the action is in the atmosphere. Entirely anthropogenic, no known natural sources. And here's uh, what some maps of the parent compounds. So these are maps of D5 concentrations uh, from the CMAC model from my group. Uh, and it looks like a map of population density. Right, because that's how we modeled it, right? We got a map of population density, assumed a per capita usage, uh, and then it blows around in the wind while slowly getting chewed up by the hydroxyl radical. Uh, these are uh, sites that had measurements at the time we did this. We published it in ACP in 2017. Uh, and Compared to lower resolution, older models, we had better performance with almost no fractional bias and a reduced fractional error. Not surprising, because we moved from 100 kilometer resolution to 36 kilometer resolution. Uh, and some of these sites are urban sites uh, that would not be well resolved in a 100 kilometer hemispheric sort of uh, model. The older models were mainly written to assess 
transport to the Arctic, right? It's a persistent compound. The Europeans did not want to see uh, compounds being used in Europe making their way to the Arctic and accumulating in the environment, in the tissue of polar bears and fish and whatnot. So that was model. Here's measurements. Um, um, the first two are from my collaborators. Uh, and the uh, second two are from Toronto and Zurich from other groups. Uh, and I said it was sort of up to 1,000 nanograms per cubic meter for D5, which is the most prevalent. Uh, and you see the highest concentrations in the most populated areas. So Manhattan has had the highest concentrations, followed by Chicago, followed by Zurich and Toronto. D5 is most prevalent followed by D4, followed by D6. So the main degradation pathway is through um, hydrogen abstraction by hydroxyl or chlorine radicals. This has been known for over 30 years. Uh, the first person who published this was Atkinson in 1991. And then my collaborator, Ellie Brown, um, compiled all the kinetic studies of the OH attack of the parent compound. Uh, so I've been talking about D4 and D5, and each dot is a different group that's done chamber studies to evaluate the um, rate coefficient. On the left are the rate coefficients, and on the right are the corresponding um, lifetimes, assuming some average OH concentration. So we've known this for a long time. Um, the piece that uh, has been added more recently is that the chlorine oxidation likely reduces the lifetime by four to six percent, uh, and that'll be higher in sort of chlorine hotspots. The rate coefficient goes up the bigger the molecule is because there's more methyl groups to attack. Right, so the thinking is that this is linear in the number of attack sites. So once we know the kinetics of transformation from the parent compound to whatever, um, we can model the whatever. <laughs> and so we've done that. Uh, so this is the oxidized D5. Uh, and we assume that it does have some loss from the atmosphere due to dry and wet deposition. Uh, but we don't know what chemical compounds this is. This is just all possible oxidation products. Uh, and so you see it highest in summer, right, when the hydroxyl radical concentrations are the highest. And so we're, we have the highest source term during summer. So this is much more smeared out with peaks existing one, 200 kilometers downwind of population centers, sort of like ozone would be. Very low concentrations. So now we're uh, not at 500 or 1,000 nanograms per cubic meter. Uh, we're at like 0 0.01 to 10 nanograms per cubic meter. So Ellie Brown, I'm showing uh, Mitch Alton and Ellie Brown's work now on what are the gas phase products. Um, and so this is a one cubic meter chamber over at Boulder. Uh, you put in, in this case, D3. So the um, three silicon ring. You put in hydrogen peroxide, you shine light on it, you get hydroxyl radical. Uh, the D3 decays away and you have these gas phase products that she's seeing with toluene sims. Uh, and the most prevalent of them is this formate ester. So we take one of the methyl groups and replaced it with this formate ester group. Uh, the next most common is the formate ester, so same compound, but now with a, a hydroxyl group over here to make the silanol, uh, and then just the silanol. So, uh, replace one methyl group with the hydroxyl radical. So just to, I'm not a chemist, I'm a chemical engineer. <laughs> so I have chemists give me rate coefficients <laughs> and then I try to say something intelligent about what that means. 
uh, but I'll walk you through uh, my understanding of this mechanism. So uh, here's D5, and I'm just drawing one of the five silicons, its neighboring oxygens, and then leaving off the rest of the ring because it just gets too busy. So then I've got one of its methyl groups and uh, then its other methyl group. So there's our hydroxyl radical. There's the barrierless transition state for the hydrogen abstraction. You cleave there, you get uh, the methyl radical and then oxygen adds to that and you get the methyl peroxy radical. After this, we don't know what's going on very well. Um, so the fate of this RO2 radical can be reaction with NO in high NOx environments, reaction with HO2 in low NOx environments. Uh, if there's nothing to react with, it will rearrange or react with itself in a um, unimolecular rearrangement or an auto oxidation. It can react with OH or with other RO2 radicals, especially in uh, chambers and, and flow reactors where you have unusually high, artificially high concentrations of these. If you just do the analogy and take methane or ethane or hexane and say, okay, we know its oxidation mechanism, what happens when its RO2 radical reacts with the HO2, what products do you get? You're going to get the methyl peroxide or the aldehyde. Here's the methyl peroxide that you would get in traditional textbook chemistry. That's not one of these compounds that Ellie's group is seeing, right? This has silicon carbon oxygen, right? All of these just have silicon oxygen, silicon oxygen. So that carbon has gone away. None of these have a carbon uh, attached to that silicon that was the site of the hydrogen abstraction. So to get there, you need a rearrangement is how most of the chemists propose it. Um, here's how Ellie and Mitch proposed it. Uh, but there are very few constraints on these reactions, right? So once you allow yourself that the radical center can move and that carbons and oxygens can switch places, the um, number of possible reactions and the number of rate coefficients that you would need uh, to constrain that system goes up like really, com it makes it very hard to constrain everything. So they did their best and then said that that model is unable to re re reproduce the measurements, right? So you can, you do have some knobs on your experimental system. You can do more NOx, you can do less NOx, you can do more OH, you can change from D4 to D5, um, you can increase, decrease water vapor concentrations, right? And those are uh, a test of whether your mechanism is good. And the current mechanism that I think this is the leading mechanism is unable to reproduce many of the shifts that you see in the product distribution. Uh, and so that points to branching points in the mechanism that are uh, not constrained. Furthermore, the physical properties, if you use... Um, structure activity relationships to try to get the partitioning behavior of these compounds, you would think that they are gonna stay in the gas phase. They are not gonna to partition to organic or aqueous aerosol according to their calculations. So we need better mechanism studies uh, under atmospheric relevant RO2 fates. Um, and then you once you have the chemist's mechanism, now I need the modeler's mechanism, a, a reduced tractable mechanism. You have to understand the aerosol formation, which may involve surface and bulk uh, heterogeneous reactions. Uh, and then we can say, what are the impacts on fate and transport? Uh, where would you find this in the environment when you're looking? What are the, how does it change aerosol properties? And this is all complicated because most of the data is coming from mass spec data that isn't just looking at molecular compounds. It's looking at fragments of molecular compounds. 
Uh, and so that adds another layer of complexity to figuring out this puzzle. And there are no pure standards except for the parent compounds. So in a lot of atmospheric chemistry studies, you'd say, okay, let's buy that yellow compound and see what it does in the chamber. Now let's buy the blue one and see what it does in the chamber. And that gives you a powerful constraint on what the pot, what, how these branching points work. Uh, those are not commercially available. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention before I start presenting some results is what's industry's perspective on this? So if you go to the silicone research uh, and industry commitment from the Global Silicones Council, it's a very, silicones are good, the environmental impacts have been overblown, they're safe, they're super useful. Um, so it's kind of a story that we've seen with some other compound classes, and it makes me worry. I don't have evidence that these reaction products are worse than the parents, but I don't want to just assume that. So um, they focus on how many workers are employed in the silicones industry, their usefulness as compounds, their tunability. Um, they believe that concentrations in the environment will decrease significantly. And to their credit, they're paying for various monitoring networks and different media to try to track that. Um, and they say based on multiple lines of evidence, the uh, persistence, bioaccumulation, and toxicity, um, D4, D5, and D6 should not be classified as persistent, bioaccumulative, or toxic. So that's where they're at. Um, and they also state the real life degradation of VMS in air may be much faster than what's currently estimated, even though we've got 40, 50 papers on the kinetics of it. So, you know, there's a missing uh, degradation process that, that maybe we're missing which is possible, uh, but I believe that that's driven by cherry picking. You go find a low concentration ambient measurement somewhere in a remote location and say, ooh, to get this, we need much more degradation without looking at alternative explanations for that measurement. So now uh, the historical perspective of my journey with these, this compound class. Iowa City, 2009, we did some chamber experiments and built a box model for these. And this was in collaboration with Vicki Grassian, uh, who's now at uh, UC Irvine, I believe, or UCSD, I forget. Um, that was pretty interesting, but it was uh, all in the lab and in a model. So we went out and did measurements. Uh, our model was a compartment model with an urban or suburban and a rural compartment. So we found measurement sites in Chicago, um, Iowa City, and in a farm field away from Iowa City, uh, and compared those to our model. And about that time, I was starting to think basically everything with more than five atoms seems to make aerosol when it gets oxidized. Uh, even though Spiros Pandas told me isoprene definitely doesn't make any aerosol, it's not worth studying. Um, uh, basically, I figured maybe CV, CVMS makes aerosol. Uh, if you burn it, you get aerosol. Um, there's a big business at removing the siloxanes prior to burning landfill gas or uh, digester gas. Um, I went out to the Iowa City landfill and they showed me their shop vac where they vacuum silica dust out of their system. So any high temperature line with uh, siloxanes going through it clogs over time because of all the siloxanes in the um, sewage stream in Iowa City. And then if you try to run an engine uh, based on that gas, it will foul due to the silica. So you can buy a carbon scrubber system that will remove that. So the particle story is not new. Bell Labs, 1964 internal memo said we're getting silicone contamination via aerosols in our switching stations. So they were using silicone oils at that time in electronics. Uh, the vapors were, built, were 
causing buildup on surfaces. There were chamber studies in the 90s, um, good chamber studies. I really like the work that uh, Rich Kamins did at UNC Chapel Hill on CVMS. But measurements in the atmosphere were always either contamination, meteoritic silicon, crustal, it is the most common element in the crust, coal combustion, uh, biomass con combustion, and then all of our analytical equipment is filled with silicones, right? And so these off-gas and cause high background levels in mass specs for uh, silicon. So um, I started talking to every aerosol scientist that would listen. Do you ever see silicon that might be photochemical in nature? Uh, Murray Johnston was the one who listened uh, at the University of Delaware, and he had the nano aerosol mass spec, which was a laser ablation instrument uh, that provided no molecular characterization, just it counted atoms, right? You have this many silicon and this many uh, sulfur and this much oxygen and so on. Uh, and at the same time, we were spinning up our CMAC model for the parent and the oxidation product. And Murray found and published that they have up to 20% mass fraction silicon in 17 to 21 nanometer particles that seemed from Murray's experience like they were photochemical in nature and probably not primary particles. So that was in Lewis, Delaware. This was in Pasadena, California. Uh, so this is two days of data. And the uh, black is the silicon trace. The red is the sulfur trace. These are daily new particle formation events. And there's more silicon in these particle bursts than there is sulfur. So to me, this was pretty strong evidence that, yes, there is a secondary uh, silicon we just don't know how much, where, how often, what are the properties. Uh, he did chamber studies in a 50 liter hard walled chamber, putting in the CVMS ozone water vapor, irradiating it to get the hydroxyl radical. Uh, and then these are um, um, volatility bins, right? And he's seeing uh, a large yield of you know, very low volatility compounds that he's um, characterizing by uh, LCMS. So I, this is the first time I'm showing this. I've been frustrated with the laboratory experiments as a constraint on yield. Um, but I looked back at Murray's work and he published an atmospheric condensable vapor concentration in Lewis, Delaware, that was consistent with his silicon measurements. He said, for this to be happening, I need this much condensable vapor in the atmosphere. And I've been impressed by how our model is doing at bearing, modeling the, com the parent compound, so I'm deciding to trust it for the uh, oxidation products. Uh, that might be dangerous, but uh, our model says there's about 2.6 nanograms per cubic meter of oxidation product in Lewis, Delaware uh, in summertime. These are summertime events. Uh, and he's saying he needs this much oxidation product that he's seeing in the aerosol phase, and that implies a 33% yield. So um, I borrowed um, Bill Brune, I called up Bill Brune, and he gave, he sent a oxidation flow reactor from Penn State for us to borrow. And uh, agreed to be a co-author if I could come up with something good. <laughs> and uh, so that was fun. And we made aerosols that look like this uh, in the oxidation flow reactor with D5 as the precursor. So this was the experimental setup. We make some clean air, humidify it, feed that into the oxidation flow reactor uh, for about a 200 second Lifetime, we inject some liquid D5, volatilize it, get that in there. We make aerosols, but we also have a lot of radicals and ozone. So we scrub that using some denuders. And then 
we could do whatever we wanted with it. Uh, we studied volatility and cloud nucleating properties, yield, uh, lung cell toxicity, and we took electron micrographs. And this is what uh, uh, 36 hours of experiments, this very hardworking graduate student. Uh, and uh, you know, we come to, to a steady state generating about 250 micrograms per cubic meter of aerosol. Uh, when we thought it was at steady state, we'd do some uh, sampling or analysis. And then we could also um, introduce sulfur dioxide uh, to quantify what our OH concentration is through the formation rate that we could see on the sulfuric acid aerosol. It was a well-behaved system that could reliably give us aerosol of a pretty constrained size and uh, mass. So the, here's uh, 125 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, if you filter it, you don't get any. If you just turn on the lights with clean air, you don't get any. Uh, if you just run air through our OFR, you don't get any aerosols. So this, these are all just quality checks. These are what the SEM uh, and TEM images look like. We get these fractal agglomerates of spherical particles with um, 20 nanometer-ish primary particle sizes. And then if you do EDS on them, so uh, you can see silicon. And you see oxygen, and then you see nickel from the substrate. Carbon doesn't image well in EDS. So these were done at RJ Lee in Pittsburgh. These are done at University of Iowa. Again, you see silicon, oxygen. The carbon doesn't resolve well. So I'm just building up evidence that we have secondary silicon aerosols in the atmosphere. Uh, the rest of our results, these are non-volatile. You can't evaporate them. Um, they are extremely hydrophobic with a, uh, a kappa for hydroscopicity uh, uh, that's pretty close to diesel oil uh, and about 10 times lower than normal SOA. Uh, the epithelial lung toxicity is a hard experiment. If you want to do OFR and then feed your aerosols to lung cells, call me up. I know some <laughs> pitfalls you can avoid. Um, but in the end, we made it work, but the results were inconclusive. Um, the lung cells do not like air coming out of the OFR even after we scrub it as best we can. Uh, but we couldn't attribute that toxicity to the particles themselves. Uh, and it wasn't dramatic. It was just, you know, 25% of the cells uh, would die. Um, and my collaborators were used to putting in, you know, copper nanoparticles that would just wipe out all the cells uh, at very low doses. Um, there was a small indication of an ammonium sulfate seed effect, uh, but it was small and variable. So in our paper, we have this figure. Um, hey, we're engineers. We took the available yield data, which was at these ridiculously high mass loadings, fit a two product model to it, uh, and then put a warning in the paper that says, don't extrapolate. <laughs> um, so people didn't. They just used the 40% uh, the yield value and called it an upper estimate. Uh, but I'm making light of it. The yields that we found at the time were between 10% and 50%. So this is, uh, there's not a lot of the parent compound out there, uh, but it's a significant yield. And if other compounds behave the same way, volatile chemical products could be an important aerosol source. So fast forward to work that's not mine, um, but uh, so here's our data with those 20 to 50% yields. Here's, uh, they needed, our, our yields were so high, they needed an inset figure at lower yields <laughs> to fit more recent data. So from the Caltech chamber, they're seeing yields below 3%, right? And these are much gentler, more atmospherically relevant uh, oxidation conditions. Uh, and the Wu and Johnston, uh, Murray Johnston's Delaware chamber work was somewhere in between. 
So this is the new mystery is, you know, what is a mechanism that can explain all of this, right? Why does it go one way in the OFR? Why does it go another way? And then what's really happening in the atmosphere? So in 2019, um, my collaborator to Iowa, Betsy Stone, found D5 oxidation products in ambient aerosols from Houston and Atlanta because every good aerosol scientist I talked to, I said, do you ever look for silicon compounds? Um, and Betsy says, I'll try. Um, and she found them. That was published in Atmospheric Environment. Uh, here were the, the daily... Um, concentrations of the siloxanol of D5. Uh, and it, the average is about 50, the median, I'm sorry, is about 55 picograms per cubic meter or 0 0.05 nanograms per cubic meter. And as I said, I'm frustrated with trying to figure out which of these is right, so let's just look to the atmosphere. If we do that with this data, our model said Atlanta had about uh, one nanogram per cubic meter of condensable stuff, reaction products. In the aerosol phase, Betsy's measuring 0 0.05. Uh, so that's a 5% aerosol yield. Yeah, I mean, this is what is being contributed from all oxidation products. Um, and this is only for uh, personal care products. So both of them are uncertain, but at least it's a, a separate constraint, which I like. In 2020, uh, sort of this same theme, uh, talking with Gary Casuccio at RJ Lee, said, you ever see silicon? He says, I see it all the time. I just don't report it because I think it's contamination. These are from indoor aerosols. They just set up a thermophoretic sampler in their office and have air flowing across it, particles land on it, they do EDS on them, and they find all these spherical nanoparticles with silicon peaks, right, that look a lot like the same EDS spectra that we get when we just put pure antiperspirant through our flow reactor. So a, a, a different independent data point that these aerosols are probably in the atmosphere. 2022, through the NSF funding, we had the um, good fortune to participate in NYC METS, which was a field uh, sampling campaign in uh, Manhattan. It was supposed to be Aroma, but Aroma got delayed, and we, uh, Aroma was delayed two years. We delayed ourselves one year <laughs> uh, and went early. Uh, so here's Manhattan. Uh, this is uh, the sampling site is at um, City College uh, in Harlem, which has extremely high population density all around that site. Uh, in our modeling, this is one of the highest sites in the U.S. for the parent and the oxidation product. Uh, so the sampling site was on top of this building, and these are the uh, Hornbuckle and Stone Group samplers set up to get the parent compound and the oxidation products, uh, both through puff filters to get semi-volatiles and quartz filters to get the aerosols. The only data I can show that's ready yet is the parent compound. Uh, and here are the parent compound measurements, which I said D5, get used to looking at 100 to 1,000 nanograms per cubic meter. Uh, D5 is the, this highest trace uh, in green. Uh, and that's what we saw in Manhattan, followed by D4, followed by uh, D6, uh, and then lower concentrations of D3. So now, uh, these are the measurements from last summer. This was our model for summer Manhattan, 36 kilometer CMAC. And we said, wow, that's lucky. <laughs> it shouldn't look that good. But uh, it just means, you know, we have the emissions approximately right. We got the boundary layer approximately right, um, is, is my take on that. Or we have compensating errors <laughs> that are uh, 
working in our favor. And that brings us to 2023, where um, as we speak, there are yield experiments going on, I hope, uh, in the Jimenez Chamber at CU Boulder. Uh, this is a photo from uh, the setup that we did on Monday. Uh, so again, trying to get more data, so bringing together the real-time SIMs from Ellie Brown, uh, the offline uh, characterization that uh, Betsy Stone has been doing. Uh, and just try to constrain all these branching points in the model and the yield a, a little better. So my takeaway points is, uh, is this a marker of humans? And I would say yes, D5 is a marker of humans uh, because it's mainly from personal care products with a lower um, use in caulk and sealants and coatings. The signal is complicated by, like any marker, any long-lived compound. There's a regional and hemispheric background, uh, so you have to factor that into your analysis. But if you want a marker that, uh, you know, if you want to sit 100 miles downwind of a city and know when you're in the plume, there's a lot of things you can look at, but D5 is definitely one of them. Uh, the signal can be complicated by uh, sewage treatment plants, landfills, industrial emissions, which would come from silicone manufacturing facilities and from um, like shampoo blending plants, which we actually had one in Iowa City. Um, it moved to Cincinnati two years ago, but that was Procter & Gamble. So if you want to do like real high resolution stuff, you have to know where the sewage treatment plant is in that town, because when the wind blows from there, you're going to get a lot. Uh, and that's not just, that's not people. I mean, it may be a Taylor Swift concert with uh, a lot of VCPs being emitted. Uh, um, as a chemical clock, right, the compound ratios don't work. Yeah, D4 reacts more slowly than D5, and you could think I could use the emissions ratio and then see that shift. But it doesn't work because D4 is used in a wider variety of compounds. Uh, so the emissions ratio changes depending on where you are and what's going on is what I think is happening. Um, molecular markers in aerosol is promising. Uh, go see Betsy Stone's 2020 paper, which I think will get updated in a nice way soon with the, um, more compounds and a better sensitivity. However, lack of understanding of the chemistry that leads to these markers limits what you can do with it. Uh, field sampling uh, for the parent compounds is pretty advanced. There's multiple groups that are doing uh, real-time one-second PTR. Um, I think there's even some inner comparison that's going to happen soon. Um, both between those fast techniques and between the offline and the slower techniques. The models are reasonably skilled at the parent compound. Uh, the aerosol uh, yield, the experimental status, the lab studies are between zero and 50% yield um, and need to be done with more realistic hydroxyl uh, concentrations, OH exposures, and the RO2 fates. Um, I like that 5.2% inferred from field data uh, that I showed from the Atlanta measurements of the Stone Group versus our Atlanta model of the um, potential condensables. Um, we hope that our field data from New York City can provide a better constraint on that. And there's many chamber and OFR studies going around. It's a, you can buy D5 from Sigma Aldridge for 80 bucks, and there's dozens of OFRs and handful of chambers, so uh, lots of people are dipping their feet in this and trying to inform what's going on. Uh, and the models need clarity on the mechanism, the yield, and the partitioning treatment. So I have my work cited, uh, which people can email me about, and I can give you a little bibliography for this. Um, but uh, I welcome questions.
we'll take questions in the room first. Thanks for the talk. Very, very interesting. Um, I have a question that um, has been bugging me since slide number three or so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that Europe has banned uh, D5 and D4s. However, in that global picture with the uh, colors, mm -hmm. you see a hotspot in Europe. That was f uh, published and in 2010, probably based on 2007. So that was well before the ban. Oh, that was before the ban. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any um, databases of how much of these cons um, BCP uh, personal care products get sold in various cities, and could you use that as a way to constrain emissions in the model, or is it just the company saying we make about this much, and you're kind of left with that? The short answer I don't know. I haven't exhaustively researched what's available for purchase. So there are marketing research reports on the personal care and cosmetics industry that may have um, useful data about variation from country to country or region to region within a country on um, PCP use. In the past, in our model, Unilever gave us three numbers, and it's described in our paper. They gave us one for the US, one for Mexico, and one for Canada uh, as a per capita estimate on um, volatile D5 use. And then we used um, atmospheric measurements to get ratios of the emissions to map that to D4 and D6, knowing that that's not a great thing to do because those compounds have other uh, sources that aren't um, stuff that you buy at the drugstore. They're stuff that you buy at the hardware store. <laughs> Here? Okay. Uh, super interesting talk. Thank you. It's a um, really interesting subject. Um, is there evidence of bioaccumulation? I mean, the, the industries are saying no, um, that there's no strong evidence for bioaccumulation. Um, but what are, what's what been shown? Has there been um, research into that other than dust from the industry, um, from independent academic studies, for example? They're, they exist, um, but I haven't tried to do my own critical read of you know, who's interpreting data properly and who's uh, interpreting it less properly. So um, the, the headline statement from the Silox Silicones Council is there's no evidence of substantial bioaccumulation but I haven't gone into sort of the independent, non-industry funded um, academic literature to try to verify that myself. A question from people online. Sorry if I missed it, uh, but what is your hypothesis about the reasons for the large differences of the chamber yield studies among themselves and uh, those versus the OFRs? Uh, I think it's the OH radical that we have more opportunities for the RO2 plus OH reaction in our um, flow reactor and that that must somehow yield uh, a low volatility product. It could be RO2, RO2. Um, we don't know. So if we group the yields based on RO2 phase, would, would that like show any better agreement based on what you said? I don't know. 
I think Mitch and Ellie sort of tried to do that, but I, I'm not sure. Follow up to that question. These emissions are all in cities, which presumably are going to have a lot higher NOx. Have any, has anyone looked at the effect of NO and NO2 or NO3 on these oxidation reactions? Yes, but not my group. Um, so Ellie um, has done NOx. Uh, the Caltech group did NOx. And I believe uh, some other very recent papers have also done NOx photooxidation. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay, another question online. Are there any reports that have looked at the changes in atmospheric concentrations in Europe from before to after the changes in regulations on the production and distribution? I'm not aware of them, but I haven't done that search um, lately. And I don't know how far along the... Um, the removal from the um, products is. So I apologize. I'm just not well informed on that part of the problem. OK. Any? So I'm curious about temperature dependence to any of the OH chlorine reactions. Have people looked at that? Is it really a? straightforward abstraction, or is there evidence for complex formation or anything like that? It has been looked at. The temperature dependence, if I'm rem remembering correctly, is, is small compared to the uncertainty in the rate coefficients themselves, which is plus or minus 30%-ish. Okay, if no more questions, let's thank Dr. Stenner again for the great talk. Yeah, and thank everyone for attending.